Um, yeah, so so I'd like to to take today to uh, to give an update on some of our recent projects. Um, on the one hand, we are, as Rich was saying, we create brain atlases. We create cell atlases in particular. Uh, and I'd like to spend a bit of time discussing uh, what those look like. They've actually evolved quite a lot in recent years uh, through sort of major consortium work that we participate in. Um, and then and then getting into what we can actually do with those atlases and the tools that are used to make them. Uh, and in, in, on the one hand, we are using that to study Alzheimer's disease. And I'd like to describe some progress on that project. Um, it also leads to tools that could be therapeutic um, interventions for gene therapy, as I'll describe a little bit as well. Um, let me briefly just say that I have a, a one conflict. I, my laboratory participates in sponsored research with Biomarine Pharmaceuticals. I won't be talking about any of that work here today, however. Okay, so um, so you know, really a lot of what we do is driven by technology. And uh, over the last decade or so, we've developed a, a very effective suite of tools for studying uh, mammalian brain, but in particular human. And this is in a lot of the work of my lab has been trying to take techniques that work in model organisms and see if we can get them to work also in humans and give us the type of precision and experimental control that one could have in a model organism, but actually applied to, to human. Um, part of this involves things like simple optimization of tissue preparation so that one can work better with postmortem tissues. Um, but the real workhorse um, has been the, the sort of molecular revolution around single cell genomics analysis. And I'll spend a lot of time talking about this today. Uh, this encapsulates several different and related techniques. Um, one of these is single cell transcriptomics, where you measure all of the genes actively transcribed by individual cells. And this can be massively scaled. Um, another is called single cell epigenomics. Uh, there are various flavors of this to look at the chromatin state or the DNA state of, of individual cells. And then most recently, um, a set of techniques called spatial transcriptomics, which allow you to, um, to have a readout on tissue sections of, at this sort of very fine, highly multiplexed molecular level. <clears throat> and so th these are kind of core to the idea of cell atlasing, that we can apply these to complex nervous tissues and uh, build a catalog and a spatial map of cell types. In addition, of course, we work with many of you uh, in the department on developing a platform for doing functional analysis of living neurons in human neurosurgical resections um, and have had a lot of success in being able to uh, to use that to study the properties of human cells and compare them uh, across species. And then finally, um, the cell atlasing sort of efforts have led very directly to be able to develop tools to target genetically particular kinds of cells. And these have a lot of applications for basic research. They also have applications potentially for, uh, for translational uh, applications. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> okay, so... Um, let me just spend a few minutes on kind of the groundwork because I'll be describing this in much more detail as we go. Um, single cell genomics really have changed this field substantially and not, not just neuroscience, but also really all of biology. Um, it's a, a suite of techniques that allows one to dissociate a tissue into its component cells or nuclei and to measure all of the genes being actively transcribed. <clears throat> Uh, there are flavors of this for looking at different uh, parts of open chromatin as well, for example, regions that are likely to be transcriptionally active or uh, DNA methylation, for example. But the idea is that one can measure in a very systematic way, in a broad, unbiased way, all the genes or all the, the parts of the chromosomes that are active in individual cells. <clears throat> and to do this across tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, now millions of cells, um, which gives you a big quantitative vector to be able to cluster. And that's the key, that you can cluster on the basis of this molecular data. And those clusters uh, are putative cell types. And then a lot of what we have been doing is just substantiating that these molecularly defined cell types, in fact, have other phenotypes that one would associate with excitatory neurons or inhibitory neurons of particular types to sort of annotate um, this classification. And so that really becomes a framework for dealing with this complexity. You can use that, that uh, technique to build a classification, then you can begin to characterize it or develop tools on the basis of it. And this really has become kind of the, the core of what we do 
uh, is to is to begin with the molecular, which is you know now is much more accepted than it was ten years ago. Uh, but it's a, a way of of um, of defining cell types based on the genes that they use. Was there a question or just some background noise? Okay. So, um, so this has become really big science now. The application of these methods um, is has really entered the the consortium space. It's fairly expensive and um, in, involved to orchestrate, uh, but there are, are major concerted efforts to apply these techniques to create a census or an atlas of cell types um, in the brain. Uh, this is sponsored by the Brain Initiative Cell Census Network, as it's called, as part of the NIH Brain Initiative. Um, and for the entire body, sort of aggregating similar efforts that are happening across all the organ systems uh, through the human cell atlas. And there are other similar efforts like HubMap, sponsored by NIH, to aggregate across organs as well. But by using the genes as the readout of, for these things, it's a generalizable method that can be applied to any organ or any species, for that matter. So in addition, um, it became clear pretty quickly when it, when it was possible to apply these techniques to human, that this has translational applications as well. And so on the basic research side, we can imagine you know, that we use these type of techniques to try to create a map. We're trying to create a, a, a quantitative classification of cell types and a spatial map of those cell types. We're trying to characterize the features of those cell types and develop tools to be able to study them. On the disease side, we can take these same techniques. We can use them to try to under, understand uh, cellular and molecular hallmarks of the disease. Um, and then if we can identify cellular targets where perhaps cells are vulnerable or they're causal for the disease, um, we can develop tools to target those now and deliver a genetic therapy to a particular kind of cell, at least in principle. So the, the um, sort of epitome of what this cell atlasing looks like was published last year. Uh, we were part of a, a publication package. Nature published an entire issue of uh, 17 articles that were all on this idea of doing a cell census in a part of the brain. Um, we had orchestrated within the BICCN to have all the different groups that were funded uh, coordinate to look at one particular brain region. This is sort of like encode for genomics applied to neuroscience, look at 1% of the brain. And uh, and then, you know, use really all of the available contemporary techniques to try to understand the cellular makeup of the brain. This includes all, this, all the single cell methods I've been describing, uh, spatial methods, uh, patch seek is a method to characterize the, uh, the properties of cells uh, that I'll get to in a little while. Uh, epi retro seek combines retrograde labeling of axons projecting to different brain regions to their source and then sequence those and identify uh, who they are. Um, and then very, and did you do it in multiple species when you did this? Yeah. Um, so this this study was done in mouse and marmoset and human. Okay. Um, so not all the techniques are easy to apply. Um, the, the the single cell techniques can be done on any species. Um, the the patch seat kinds of things need living tissues, so that's uh, significantly harder. Um, and retrograde labeling types of studies are really limited to small brains where you can you can do that. Uh, no one has a solution yet for doing that in human. Thank you. Yep. Um, and so the out, you know, we get some really remarkable outcomes of this. We get a quantitative classification of all the cell types and their proportions. We get a spatial map of their distributions, and we understand what they are. And so you know, this is really what we mean by a census of cell types. And just to, to dive a little bit deeper. Um, this is what this census looks like uh, applied to, um, represented as, as a series of, of defined cell types. Um, and I appreciate that this is extremely complex, but really that's kind of the point. Like the brain is extraordinarily complex from a cellular perspective. This is what one particular region of the cortex looks like. There are more than 100 kinds of cells in there. Uh, most of them are rare. Um, but they're they're definable quantitatively on the basis of their gene expression patterns. And they can be represented as a hierarchical organization where you have sort of cells derived from neural lineage and non-neuronal lineage. And then within the neural, you have neuro neuronal versus non-neuronal. Within neuronal, you have GABAergic versus glutamatergic. So, and so on down to uh, these sort of finer levels. And that hierarchy is very useful, sort of a set subset that Sometimes you, it's more useful to be thinking of a higher level grouping 
And those higher level groupings tend to be um, uh, coming from particular developmental zones. So it's got a tight link to developmental biology as well. So this is a really powerful uh, tool since we know a lot about the properties of these cells that we can think about you know, using as the basis for studying disease. Now, the really key uh, thing for being able to apply to human or across species is that um, we're able to apply these methods to any species, um, as Rich, has, as you were just asking. Um, so in this particular case, we, we looked at human marmoset and mouse. Um, in other studies now, we've looked at more than 20 mammalian species. Um, it's possible to do this in any species with high quality tissue. And um, in each species, if you do this well, um, you derive a quantitative classification. Um, the organization of this looks strikingly similar across mammals. And we now have computational tools to be able to do what I'd like to call homology mapping. You map across these species data sets um, and these confusion matrices in the middle are just intended to show that there's really good agreement in these cell types across uh, mammalian species. And so we can ultimately derive a, a consensus taxonomy where we can comp compare the same kinds of cells across species. And with few exceptions, um, there really is striking conservation across the species at the level of cell types. There are many, many ways that, that there are species differences that I could elaborate on, but, but the level of kind of the core canonical cell types, this seems to be a very well-conserved organization. And that's useful because um, we can infer things in the human from the model organisms where it's possible to study more. So for example, one of these clusters is the, the intratelencephalic projecting or corticocortical projecting um, excitatory neurons in layers two and three. And of course, we never can study that those are actually projecting across the hemispheres um, or for distant cortical regions in the human, but they do so in the mouse and the monkey, and so they almost certainly do in the human. So we can infer a lot from that. Con uh, conversely, we can also see how well or not well um, a model organism is for recapitulating properties of human. Okay, so I also just wanted to, to highlight that um, actually, I, this is this is for my own amusement. Really, uh, five years ago or so, I published a, a perspective paper on the new spatial methods, with the idea that you know it's becoming clear that you could do this grind up a tissue assay and define cells by their genes, it, but you want to see this in space. You want to see how they're organized in a tissue or how they might be disorganized in disease. So we we had this idea that you could define combinations of genes that, as a panel, would be able to discriminate among all the cell populations. And if you had a method like single molecule fluorescent in situ hybridization, where you could look at <clears throat> all of those genes together in a tissue section, you could pin an identity on every cell, and then you could understand their spatial organization. This was you know, fairly speculative at that point. Five years later, here's the situation. Um, I just described to you one uh, single brain region covered with these single cell genomics technologies. Uh, and, and now our, my, my colleague Hong Kui Zheng at the Allen Institute has completed her project uh, through the Brain Initiative to map the entire mouse brain. So this crazy UMAP on the left here is an attempt to represent 5,000 or so clusters in one two-dimensional representation. Uh, it's only, it really looks more like art than, uh, than science, but um, there's, there's a ton of structure here. These cell types really reflect brain organization if you start to iteratively dive down into this. And related to the spatial, we now have commercial technologies such as uh, the commercial version of a technique called MRFISH, or, which is called MRScope as the commercial entity, um, which can map about 500 genes at a time on tissue sections. And this has been used then to translate this more abstract classification into a tissue map uh, that's going to be available uh, for the public later this year uh, that, that turns this into a, a spatial organization of the cell types. So in very, very short order, the, the scalability of these techniques has allowed a complete mapping of the mouse brain. In parallel, uh, we've had a lot of efforts on trying to show that the same thing can happen in adult human. And uh, this, this has been done through the Brain Initiative, um, spearheaded by my group working with several other groups, uh, most notably the uh, Sten Linnerson's group at the Karolinska Institute in Sweden. Um, we have looked at, kind of done a survey of about 100 different brain regions and shown that all these same methods work across the brain. 
there are of course challenges. The human is so much more myelinated. It has, uh, it's much more difficult to capture the rarer populations, but it can be done. And also we've shown now that these, um, that these murfish style experiments can also be done on human tissues. Uh, so we worked with the, the developer of this technique, Murfish. His name is Xia Wei Shuang at Harvard, um, and showed that this can be applied to human cortical samples. And now you get to see that this, you know, these uh, really um, complicated uh, dendrograms, as showing as types now, have very striking uh, cellular organizations. The excitatory neurons, as expected, are, are quite tightly laminar. Uh, but the inhibitory neurons also have uh, quite a bit of laminarity and even non-neuronal cells. So, you know, this pretty, pretty remarkable, I think, that we, you know, we have the techniques now that this idea of, like, let's break down the system into its component parts and get their map um, is entirely feasible and is done for, uh, for one organism. And um, I'll just give a little uh, a teaser into the future. The NIH Brain Initiative Cell Census Network has is entering a new phase now called the brain initiative cell atlas network and the focus of this is to get detailed whole brain cell atlases in human and non-human primate and i think that we can definitely anticipate that an output of this is going to be a complete map of the cell types across a marmoset macaque and human um, and at least in some of those species will turn into these uh, whole brain spatial maps of the locations of the cells <clears throat> and then finally, um, I, you know, one, one thing which has made this type of work, I think, a bit less relevant for a lot of the neuroscience community is that it really isn't linked in uh, yet to the functional imaging world. And of course, you're all very familiar with that the, in, the, in the functional imaging world, we have also atlas makers uh, like David Van Essen uh, working on parcellations of the cortex in particular. Uh, to try to understand the functional organization of cortex. Um, and then even within individuals, uh, there's a lot of variation in the location of particular regions in individuals. Uh, so within individual, uh, you can define uh, very specific regions, such as those involved in you know, sp speech or face recognition, various other, uh, various other things. And so a, a, a key element of this next phase of the, of the human brain cell atlas making is really did try to put these things together. And, um, and that requires going back to the stage of brain preparation, actually. Um, so Dirk Keen is actually playing a, a really nice role in this in uh, helping to work with uh, Eugenio Iglesias and Bruce Fischel and others, um, and Christine McDonald, to try to find a way to be able to re reconstruct a volume of a human brain at the time of preparation so that you can map it against an fMRI-based template space and to project any parcellation from that template down onto the frozen slabs and actually guide all the sampling. Uh, because we really want this cell atlas to be related ultimately to the functional organization of the brain. Um, and, you know, of course, it makes sense that the cells form circuits and the circuits form the function, but it's actually quite difficult to make that happen. So, but this is what's coming in the future is uh, whole, whole brain maps of human that are hopefully uh, put into a space that is relevant for uh, many different disciplines. Okay, I'm going to shift gears now. Hopefully that gave you an idea of sort of the, the state of the field for uh, brain cell atlasing. Um, we have a couple of years ago now, I call this my COVID project, um, almost on the day that COVID uh, sent us all home, uh, we began a new project uh, called the Seattle Alzheimer's Disease Brain Cell Atlas, or CAD. Uh, which is a, a really terrific collaboration uh, between the Allen Institute, uh, UW Medicine, and Kaiser Permanente. Uh, this funded by the National Institute on Aging. And the, the idea really was to bring this set of tools coming from the, the Brain Initiative to begin to study um, Alzheimer's pathology and really get a, a sort of fresh, high-resolution understanding of what really happens uh, with Alzheimer's pathology. Uh, this is a pretty big team project, I should say, that's um, like most things at the Allen Institute, it ends up touching a lot of different departments. Uh, here's a, a glimpse of, of the cohort here that's, uh, that's working on this project. Um, and then some of, some of your colleagues here over on the other side, uh, Dirk and Tom Grabowski, uh, Eric Larson, Paul Crane, 
um, and many of the other colleagues here. So it's been a, a really fantastic collaboration to bring our respective skills together to try to tackle, uh, try to apply these methods to Alzheimer's cohorts that are being generated at the UW and Kaiser sites. And Christine McDonald too. Yep, sorry, I mentioned her earlier, but I didn't mention her on this slide yet, right there. <clears throat> um, so the, the idea really was to use the cohorts from the UW ADRC and the ACT program at Kaiser <clears throat> to uh, build a cohort of individuals spanning the spectrum of Alzheimer's disease that we could then apply our various techniques of analysis to, um, including neuropathological analysis at the UW side, and to try to turn this really into a quantitative uh, process. Um, the single nucleus RNA-seq and attack-seq is one of the epigenetic methods on uh, the Allen side, and then eventually also bring the spatial methods uh, to understand the what what kinds of cells are are lost perhaps or um, what the relationship of pathology and and vulnerable cell populations are <clears throat> and to try to integrate all this information and then ultimately to make a product as well and we actually just had a product release of data that uh, may be of interest to some of you so um, again I want to highlight this uh, this effort from Dirk um, you know he and Christine have um, have really been doing some things that I think are going to change the fields substantially about how these brains are prepared. Um, you know, we had seen some time ago that that by bringing some of the conventional methods of preparing monkey or mouse tissues to, to preparing brain tissue, human brain tissues, that we can get very high quality material, um, both for RNA and DNA content, but also for histological preservation for uh, for those types of applications. Um, so. Um, he has adopted now this rapid uh, preparation method that involves um, putting brain in a, in a solid alginate mold, uh, slabbing these, uh, these specimens very carefully um, into very thin slabs, like four millimeter slabs, um, and then also capturing uh, surface images. And Christine is even trying to do a tabletop MR of the frozen hemisphere prior to this type of preservation. This turns out to be really, <clears throat> really important for getting high quality material. <clears throat> Excuse me. The um, just to dive into a little bit more detail, um, we've been looking at several different parts of of the brain as, to start this project off. Um, one of these is the middle temporal gyrus. Uh, this is a good region, both from the uh, point of view of progression of Alzheimer's pathology out of the temporal lobe, but also because it's the one where we know the most from all of our other studies um, using surgical specimens from epilepsy resections, for example, with uh, with many of you. Um, we're also trying to look at different regions that are affected at different stages of the disease. Uh, so entorhinal cortex early, prefrontal cortex later. Um, and uh, this is only the first set of regions. We'll be looking at more regions as well. <clears throat> um, Dirk is performing quantitative neuropathology. Um, he actually changed his whole approach to doing um, an image-based uh, quantification for uh, for neurons, for uh, for tau and TDP43, uh, activated microglial markers, a beta, of course, astrocytes, Lewy bodies. Um, alternating slabs come to the Allen Institute, and we perform our different single cell omics methods on these, uh, either uh, single nucleus RNA seq or TAC seq, or now there's a, a technique marketed to do both of them at the same time called multiome. And then eventually this technique of Murfish, as I've mentioned. Um, the cohort is now up to about 84 that we've looked at, and this spans the, the range of pathology um, from Brox 0 to 6. Um, it's a pretty old cohort, mostly coming from the ACT study, so almost, almost 90 average age um, spanning this range. And the point that I was making earlier <clears throat> is that despite this really advanced age and a lot of pathology, um, with this brain preparation method, we get really high RNA quality uh, almost across the board, except for a, a few of the high pathology cases um, <clears throat> show lower lower quality. So um, getting old does not necessarily mean that your cells are falling apart. You know, we have very good RNA. It's it's a bit more in the preparation method than uh, than perhaps uh, it, it seemed. <clears throat> um, on Dirk's side, I just want to highlight that uh, that he's applied uh, machine learning approaches to be able to take these images and do 
um, image segmentation and quantification. And this really seems to map uh, very well to uh, conventional neuropathologist scoring, um, except that it captures the variance much more. So instead of there being uh, presence or absence of a, of a pathological marker in a particular tissue, um, now we can capture the burden of pathology with this. <clears throat> and that term seems to work better as we compare it to the, uh, to the single nucleus data. Okay, so then uh, finally, we can take this, um, this quantification of, of the neuropath markers and actually use that to derive a quantitative vector that represents disease progression. And fortunately, you know, this really actually works quite well. Uh, you can bring techniques of doing uh, what's called pseudo time analysis using a set of the features derived from that, or you can simply do principal component analysis. And the, um, that vector really seems to, uh, to match well the burden of pathology um, and also uh, conversely cognitive score. Uh, and so that this is really kind of part of this whole approach is let's be very data driven about things. Um, and so one element of that is derive an ordering of these of these specimens by the burden of pathology. So then um, on the other side, this is a very complicated slide. I just want to make a few points um, that are a bit simpler than the slide would appear. Um, in order to use the brain initiative cell reference, uh, we had to modify it a bit. And so one of the things that we that we wanted to do is to make sure that this that all of the cell types can be reliably mapped to. If we're going to take a whole new Alzheimer's cohort and try to map it and use those labels, they need to be very robust. Um, so um, we have uh, actually ended up adding clusters and then pruning some of those. Uh, to get a set of, of clusters that could be reliably mapped to. Then all of these 84 donors worth of information are mapped against this reference. And one of the things that, that, uh, that comes from that is that there are certain kinds of cells that were not well captured in the reference, either as because of how we created the reference or because they're disease associated states of cells. And so by mapping all of these two the reference and then seeing you know what kind of what we got extra we can embellish the reference so it now includes these um these different states of cells uh such as a microglial state that is that appears to be only in the in the alzheimer's patients so modified reference so now we have the pieces we can start to ask questions about what's really happening as a as a over the course of disease <clears throat> and um i'm going to you know overwhelm Probably most of you, this is uh, overwhelming to, to most of us, but we're used to looking at this. But this is kind of the beauty of, of these data sets is that we can assay all cell populations simultaneously in these tissues and really look comprehensively at what cell populations are affected. And one of the, the sort of first order kinds of questions we can ask are whether there are proportions that change with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, as a function of cognitive status, as a function of more traditional neuropathology, as a function of this new quantitative pathological marker that, uh, vector that I just described. So you're looking at this taxonomy now where bars going down mean that there is a relative loss of those cells and bars going up means that there is a relative increase in the proportion of those cells um, over the course of, of AD pathology. And uh, so I think, let me start to annotate this now, so this starts to become understandable. Um, on the, on the um, one side, we have the excitatory neurons, where there's a, a subset of excitatory neurons that seem to be selectively lost. There are also inhibitory neurons, um, both from the sort of MGE-derived, the somatostatin and parvalbulin positive uh, types of cells, as well as um, you know, lesser effects on the, on the CGE derived, this includes like the VIP cells, for example. And then on the non-neuronal side, uh, there actually are uh, several states of non-neuronal cells that seem to be increasing in proportion. Uh, not terribly surprising. Uh, there's a microglial state that increases. Um, there's also an astrocytic uh, state that seems to be increasingly over-represented in these tissues and perhaps a drop in oligos. <clears throat> so, you know, I, I, I think, you know, this is worth just a moment of, of reflection to see that um, there are, there is 
you know, widespread neuronal loss, but it's also very specific, actually. There are many types of, of neurons that are seemingly unaffected in Alzheimer's. Uh, so this really starts to pin some places where we should maybe focus our efforts for why, why are these particular kinds of cells uh, vulnerable um, and what are they, in fact? So I'll just spend a few minutes now on, on breaking this down a little bit further. So first of all, on the excitatory neuron side, the bulk of the effect seems to be on the um, IT neurons. That's why I used that example earlier on, the layer two and three intratelencephalic projecting neurons of uh, the cortex. And uh, these are, are long range cortical cortical for the most part, maybe cortical striatal projecting um, excitatory neurons. In fact, these are a cell population that we have been studying with the neurosurgical resections uh, that many of you have helped to provide. Um, we recently published as part of that uh, publication package I described earlier, a characterization of the properties of all of these cells. And so we now can see that those, uh, we've speculated that some of these may be, uh, may be lost. Um, it turns out that now we have direct evidence from these Alzheimer's uh, uh, tissues that in particular, the deep layer three populations uh, seem to be selectively depleted uh, over the course of Alzheimer's disease. And uh, importantly, actually, several of these populations are really not found in the mouse, so they can't be studied there. On the um, inhibitory side, I think we know much less. That was the excitatory side was maybe a bit more predicted. On the inhibitory side, uh, this is much less predicted. It turns out that the, the bulk of the effect, as I described, was in um, these uh, somatostatin positive interneurons, so the Mark Noddy types of cells, <clears throat> the parvalbumin neurons, the basket types of cells, for example. Um, and it turns out that, that these are actually um, also predominantly located in layers two and three. <clears throat> so the inhibitory neurons that are lost are right next to the excitatory neurons that are lost. Um, and we've actually been studying these also with the surgical tissues for some time. And we know the dominant types that seem to be lost are, include one of the basket cell uh, types of parvalbumin cells, um, a type of cell kind of a little bit intermediate between uh, PV and SSD, and then a, a type of cell that includes these famous double bouquet cells, which are um, uh, which we've also been able to study with those tissues. So, you know, I, I, what I'm trying to convey is, you know, as we as we understand what these clusters actually mean, we can start to interpret what the consequences might be for a loss of those cells. And then finally, um, on the Ed, uh, yes, can I stop here? Uh, I I have a question. What percentages of uh, cell loss are these? Because uh, I see on the on the left there, it's say point uh, one something. Is that in fold or in percentages? No. So I'm actually I'm I'm presenting effect sizes here. Um, so there, um, I'm not showing you the direct proportion loss. Um, it, it I have to actually go see what the Full depth is, um, you know, it's not it's not total loss of anything, um, but but it probably could be you know up to half of these deep layer uh, deep layer excitatory neurons, deep deep layer three excitatory neurons, so they're they're fairly affected. All right. Yep. Okay. So then finally, uh, finally on the um, on the non neuronal side, we also see selective effects. Um, the astrocytes. This seems to be uh, the protoplasmic astrocytes that are being affected, and the microglia, this is actually a, a state which is not seen in the younger neurotypical, um, and it bears uh, some resemblance to a, a population that's been described in mouse models as disease-associated microglia or, or DAM microglia. Um, so we see a pretty clear microglial effect as well. But note that it's not all microglial types or all astrocyte types. It's very specific types. So I think, you know, that the point here really is that, you know, there are selective effects, even if they're somewhat broad overall. Um, and so we're able to get a handle on that now with these, these kinds of methods. So then finally, I just, I just wanted to mention one other thing um, with, related to, um, to these cases. In addition to this sort of progression that we see, um, there were a set of cases that were particularly highly affected. Um, they they were failing a lot of the nuclei with QC. They appear to have just less RNA, um, but it's not just a poor quality uh, cell per se. Uh, 
Um, their chromatin landscape seems to be repressed, so there aren't there's not so much open chromatin, which would reflect active transcription. Um, and it was really uh, puzzling for a little bit, you know, what was going on here. Uh, but it, it seems that there are a subset of cases that are particularly highly affected, and they are affected in just about everything that we measured. Uh, so, for example, um, Dirk's team had done new end staining uh, to really as a way just to count the neurons, but it turns out that the new end labeling goes down, particularly in those cases. And then when we look back in the case histories of those uh, donors, um, these most severely affected cases also um, had the most precipitous decline in their cognitive scores in the last years of life. So there really seemed to be a you know, subset of these where things really, really go off the rails and the cells actually start to shut down. They start to look like senescent cells. Um, and in those cases, they have a rapid decline uh, to, to eventually passing away. So um, the final thing that I wanted to mention on this is that you know, we're trying to build trajectories of disease. We're trying to understand what the process of disease is leading to these, uh, to these changes. And so we can look at what actually happens uh, at the earliest stages. And so e we can do this even with just one brain region, but of course we can do this better with more brain regions. Um, and a surprise from this already um, is that um, the inhibitory neurons actually seem to be the first population that's dropping out from the neurons rather than the excitatory populations. Uh, and in particular, the somatostatin interneurons. We also see early astrocyte and microglia effects as well. Um, but that was really an, quite unanticipated that the SST neurons might drop out uh, sooner. And we've actually sort of anecdotally have started to look at the frontal cortical areas as well. And in those areas, uh, which uh, pathology is occurring later, um, we also see this earlier dropout of the somatostatin neurons. So I don't know exactly why that population would be more vulnerable than the other, but uh, one can imagine a cascade of events where they're the initially vulnerable population. The loss of them actually leads to loss of the neighboring pyramidal neurons. Okay, so, uh, so this project is progressing. Um, as I have just described here, we intend to go for disease trajectories, and that means looking at more brain regions. Uh, so most of the projects in the field now are look, trying to look at more and more and more individuals, but in the same brain region. <clears throat> we want to try to look across brain regions and see if we can build trajectories of disease within individuals, because this is a progressive, uh, progressive disease. So in any given individual, there will be regions that are very affected and regions that are are less affected or not yet affected. <clears throat> so hopefully we can build the trajectory of disease and then bring the spatial methods to bear on this as well. And then finally, um, you know, we are also really striving to make a public resource that would be useful for the community as a whole. Um, we just had our, our first uh, big uh, public data release um, in July, and it has a whole suite of tools for looking at these data from you know, really from a lay user through a power user who wants to download the data and, and go and analyze it. <clears throat> Some of these tools are actually extremely useful. Uh, I use them on a daily basis now. So I encourage you to, uh, to explore those for uh, understanding where a gene might be used in, in the brain. <clears throat> okay, I want to spend, um, I have one last segment to this, to this uh, talk here that I wanted to bring uh, one other uh, somewhat different topic. Um, to focus here, and that is that the single cell omics data has opened up a brand new field by revealing regulatory regions that are responsible for cell type selective gene expression. <clears throat> so not only can we measure all the genes in individual cells, we can measure the chromatin state in those cells uh, with a technique called ATAC-seq. What ATAC-seq does basically is to clip out regions of open chromatin. And this can be done now at a, a single cell level. Those regions of open chromatin tend to be regions that are transcriptionally active or potentially transcriptionally active. And so you'll see the genes that are active are, are very open, They're, they get measured by this. But in addition, you, you get analysis of regulatory domains that are distal to the genes. Uh, these are so-called enhancers. And on the right side of this plot here, you can see now sort of on a genome track, pileups here that show that there are regions of open chromatin 
that are selective for each of these major cortical cell types in this case. Um, and so we can mine for these. These are potentially enhancer regions that could uh, be used to drive uh, cell type selective gene expression. So we're, we've really been trying not so much to understand the regulatory biology, but to develop tools to allow us to target particular kinds of cells. And so just to give you an idea of what this looks like, you know, this pairs very well with uh, relatively recent advances in AV capsid um, generation, and in particular, a, a suite of capsids that have been um, initially came from Paul Patterson's lab at Caltech, um, very much modified by Viviana Gradinaro at Caltech. Um, and the most useful of these is called PHPEB, which is a, a very highly infectious blood-brain barrier crossing uh, capsid. And so this allows us to create constructs where we can put an enhancer in an expression cassette into this PHPEB vector, inject it into the retroorbital vein or direct injection, <clears throat> and get brain-wide transduction of neurons whose expression is controlled by those regulatory elements that we put in the construct. And so, for example, up on the upper left here, this is a pan-neuronal uh, promoter, um, the synapse in one promoter. You can see it labels cells just amazingly uniformly across the entire mouse brain. You can begin to restrict that. On the upper right here is an inhibit forebrain inhibitory neuron enhancer, so it's only in the GABAergic neurons in the forebrain. We have many other types now, um, astrocyte enhancers, oligodendrocyte enhancers, for example. This turns out to be incredibly generalizable. Now that we have this attack data for many parts of the brain, we can mine for regulatory domains that are selective for pretty much any cell population. And with enough effort, we can find tools that allow us to target these. So here's just a, a gallery of, of a number of these uh, to give you an idea. Um, so these are not transgenic animals. These are viruses injected into the brain that deliver or convey cell type specificity for the striatum for different kinds of, of inhibitory neurons, for example, the parvalbumin, somatostatin, VIP, even the chandelier cells, um, many different uh, brain regions. Some of these are serendipitous because these have uh, somewhat uh, promiscuous uh, expression in different parts of the brain. But, um, but this is really pretty remarkable. Um, all of a sudden, in the span of a few years, we went from no tools that, could, that, that work effectively in uh, non-genetically tractable organisms to just a plethora of tools that are coming on. It's really just a matter of mining these data to be able to produce those tools. <clears throat> um, we've also come up with ways of being able to, uh, to enhance these tools. So sometimes these enhancers are not uh, as specific or as robust as we would like. So there are ways to, uh, to enhance this. One of these is to um, concatamerize these. Uh, so that you'll have a short enhancer. We can find the core region that works and multiply it. And that sometimes has a nonlinear effect on the expression level. Um, there are microarray um, things that we can add to either suppress, generally to suppress expression in particular kinds of cells. You can clean up a messy expression pattern, um, or you can start to pair them and you can have um, constructs that can target more than one cell type in a particular vector. Uh, so for example, combining a GABAergic enhancer with an astrocyte enhancer. Um, a, somewhat of a surprise to us was that um, although we were screening these in mice, the majority of these enhancers tend to conserve that expression pattern across species. And so this has become a very effective approach to take human sequences, screen them in mouse, and then work our way back up to monkey or human to test these. <clears throat> um, and so here are a series of examples of conserved expression patterns um, in astrocytes, in oligodendrocytes, in the VIP neurons, you can see all these bipolar types of morphologies, parvalbumin neurons, the um, deep layer five projecting neurons, for example. Um, so we have sudden, you know, genetic access to all these, and we have tools which which work across species as well. And so th this brings me back to um, to my work with with a uh, number of you. Uh, we've had the you know great fortune to be part of this department and to be able to work with many of you and to work with, um, with tissues derived from uh, the surgeries for either epilepsy or uh, tumor removal. Um, and we've really put these to good use. I'd like to show you some, some of the latest uh, things that we're doing with them. Um, and we also have been doing this uh, as, a, as an international collaboration with a smaller number of other groups who do uh, similar work. So the technique that we use for this is called patch seek. Uh, 
uh, as, as uh, many of you know, uh, this is conventional slice physiology, where at the end of the experiment, we extract the nucleus and sequence it. And so this kind of gives us the trifecta for a particular cell. We're able to characterize the electrophysiological response properties. We can fill it with a, with a dye with biocytin. Uh, we can get recover the anatomy of those cells. And by measuring the nucleus, we're able to map to this transcriptomic classification. Uh, just to kind of show off what a really beautiful section looks like, uh, this is kind of what we can do with a, with a, a, a really high quality piece of tissue. Uh, there are 10 neurons here that were successfully patched onto, reconstructed, uh, and got a, a molecular measurement done. It doesn't always work as well as that. <clears throat> so, um, so now, uh, the, the advance over the last couple of years has been to start to bring these genetic tools to work with these human tissues and also uh, now non-human primate tissues. So we can take these surgical specimens, slice them into vibratome sections, and then apply these viruses to them. And this infects the cells. And some of these, um, these enhancers maintain that specificity in a culture paradigm. Some actually do not. You know, it's a pretty traumatic situation for a slice. It changes their chromatin state or expression state. They don't all work, but uh, some of them work really well. And so, for example, um, the GABAergic neuron selective enhancer works extremely well. We can get bright labeled cells to target. If you extract those cells and sequence them, they're all uh, GABAergic neurons. And so we've now been able to, to start to, uh, to study the types of cells that really have been inaccessible to do routinely with, um, with non-labeled tissues, um, trying to get rare populations with blind patching is, is a really tedious and thankless job. But now we have tools to be able to light those neurons up and target them selectively. And one of the um, key things that we've also seen from this is that the cardinal properties of cells seem to be maintained in adult slice culture so that we can still study them over a, a week or more of time in culture that it takes to, um, to, put, to slice the tissues to apply the virus and then to be able to um, analyze the cells. We've done a lot of work to show that the basic properties of the cells are really not affected very much over time. So we can understand kind of their normal state even in this um, experimental paradigm. And <clears throat> just to give you, you know, a couple of ideas of the, th of the things that are coming out from this, we're starting to get an understanding of what all the inhibitory neurons look like from the perspective of morphology and physiology. Um, we're seeing that there are some species differences. Uh, so one of those is that in human, the parvalbumin and the somatostatin types of cells, which are quite well segregated in mouse, are actually not quite as well segregated in human. <clears throat> there are, are sort of border cases. They blend, bleed into one another, and we're starting to resolve really kind of which populations go with which. And we've been able to start to understand which transcriptomic types contain uh, some of the famous, uh, famous types of, of uh, inhibitory neurons like the double bouquet cells, which are also not seen in mouse, uh, these really remarkable uh, cells that send these descending um, um, projections down into deeper layers. So they actually belong to uh, two of these transcriptomic clusters. So this is kind of, uh, you know, where we're going. We're able to to begin to apply these tools to study things that have never been possible to study before. So then I, I just want to end on <clears throat> one very quick <clears throat> um, uh, idea here, which is that these tools are not just basic research tools. These are things which can actually be uh, potential therapeutic vectors. And <clears throat> on the one hand, you know, I think that demonstrating that these things work across species has major implications for working in in the basic research field, or to be able to select a model organism for what it's best for studying. <clears throat> we can now use these tools to study in, in a pig or a ferret or a rat. Um, you're not limited to mouse as a model organism uh, at all. <clears throat> but on the other hand, that we could now do um, targeted delivery of a therapeutic transgene to the right kind of cell for um, gene therapy applications. And so um, just to, to illustrate uh, what I mean by this, um, let me use the striatal system as a, as a backdrop for this. Um, 
you know, the striatum is, of course, involved in a wide variety of diseases, uh, most notably Parkinson's and Huntington's, but also other dystonias, Tourette's, um, OCD, uh, for example. And uh, it's got a pretty well-established circuitry now of the striatal interneurons that form the direct and indirect pathways, uh, connections through the globus pallidus, substantia nigra, thalamus, cortical loops. <clears throat> and we've been able to now develop a toolkit to be able to target all of those major circuit elements. Um, we can target the medium spiny neurons of the striatum. We can differentially target the direct or the indirect pathways. We have D1, D2, and D3 medium spiny neurons. We can target all of the individual uh, inhibitory neuron populations, cholinergic, somatostatin, parvalbumin, for example. We can even selectively target the striosome matrix um, organization. And these tools are just really quite remarkably specific, as I demonstrated in this movie here. Um, this is shown in a mouse brain with serial sectioning, uh, just how specific these tools can be in robust. <clears throat> so this really opens up the possibility for selective delivery of a therapeutic gene to just the right structure uh, to try to uh, ameliorate clinical symptoms. And one of the places that we're, uh, that we're beginning to explore at the Institute is um, application to Parkinson's disease, where you know, already it's, of course, well known uh, the involvement of the substantia nigra dopaminergic neurons in their loss. Uh, there are clinical trials to try to uh, improve dopamine synthesis uh, using AADC, for example, but they're not very selective at this point. So, uh, so the idea is, you know, what if we could selectively del deliver to the striatum or to the substantia nigra um, uh, therapeutic genes, which would either try to prevent their degeneration or, or bolster uh, in this case, uh, dopamine synthesis. And just to give you kind of a teaser, you know, we are able to deliver AADC uh, to the striatum uh, in, a, in rodents very easily uh, with this type of technique. So it's not just a fluorescent gene, this is uh, actual uh, human AADC. And that we can actually do this as well now in monkeys. And so on the right-hand side here, uh, you're seeing uh, direct injections into the cardioputamen uh, with this same vector where the labeled cells are in um, sort of magenta here. And what you can see is you don't see cells in structures around the striatum. So the, we did targeted injections, but this virus spills all over the place um, and it's not labeling cells in the vicinity. So I really think, you know, this is just a, a teaser for this audience, but I think you can get the idea that um, we can I, we can develop a tool to target pretty much any kind of cell, and uh, I think probably many of you can imagine use cases for how you could deliver a therapeutic using that type of tool. So I'll end here. Uh, I just want to say, uh, you know, hopefully I've given you kind of a, an update of, of the field and conveyed to you what cell atlases really look like, um, how these same tools can be used to start to get a cellular understanding of, of disease with Alzheimer's. <clears throat> and how this directly leads to the uh, development of tools to target cell types, which I think opens up this idea of, of the cell type as a, as a point of, of therapeutic in, uh, intervention. Uh, with that, I'd, I'd like to really thank um, many of the people involved. I've, I've related the work of, of a huge number of people at the Allen Institute, uh, plus contributing through the Brain Initiative Cell Census Network. Um, and this was funded by uh, NIA, by NIMH, um, and um, a little bit through the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative.